this is Harriet Kimmick with Down to Earth. It's just one of those days when stuff happens, right? But we're going to have a good show nonetheless. Thank you so much for joining me. Today is Wednesday. I can't believe it. <laughs> it's Wednesday, January 22nd. It's 22 days already into the new year, into the new decade. Can you believe it? We just started. It seems like we just started a few days ago and here we are 22 days later. And folks, time is moving. If, if, if this is any indicator of anything, it's that time is moving, right? It looks like time is moving. <laughs> so today on our show, we're gonna talk about uh, people who view politics as a hobby. And this is specifically what in this study, they, they interviewed uh, white Americans, white college educated Americans. So college educated white Americans who view politics as a hobby and their impact on politics over the last 50 years, how their views and lack of activism has impacted politicians, the vote, and how they have contributed or not to the discourse, right? They have a lot of discoursing, but they don't do a lot of the actual work. So we're going to talk in depth about that. But in the meantime, while you're joining me, if this is your first time, thank you for joining our podcast for those of you on periscope and twitter i appreciate your support and thank you so much if you are just listening to us on spotify or spreaker or dynamo or blog talk radio or apple or google or spotify any of the podcast platforms podcast addict i hear it's a good thing right <laughs> overcast <laughs> right? Radio Public. So any of the podcast platforms that you might be listening to us on, thank you so much for listening and for participating. From time to time, for those of you who are just listening, whilst I have a live Twitter and Periscope feed, I will perhaps respond to comments that are here. And if you want more information about who I am and what I do, it's simple. Just go to www.harrietcamuff.com or you can find my landing page on Google and it will direct you to my websites and it will direct you to tell you just a little bit more about what we do. Right? So it's 2020 and it's campaign time. And as you can see, the rhetoric has been building up. I guess the rhetoric never left after the 2016 election, that's for sure. But now that it's 2020, I don't want to say that it has ramped up so much more than it is dominated. I mean, I'm about to change my Twitter preferences because I am inundated with politics. I think I'm a little overwhelmed. I, I, I want to see other stuff. I want to know what else is going on in the world and what else is going on in the country and what other and what people are thinking, what are others thinking. I, I am just inundated with sound bites. I, I'm tired of it. And it's all negative. It's not driving policy change like we want to like recently uh on my twitter feed it popped up uh that mothers who had uh squatted in a house in oakland california were evicted forcibly by by soldiers with guns at first i thought it was an insurrection you know i thought something major had happened no it was just single mothers with their children who were homeless and who had slept in a house to take their children off the streets and the forcible eviction that was being executed was happening by men with guns. It was appalling to look at. It's, it's crazy. You know, housing is a human right. And in the United States, it's shameful that we have to talk about housing as a human right. It's shameful. How dare we go to another person's country and tell them they can't house their own people when we have, in two years, the, the homeless population in San Francisco went up 47% to 4,000. California has an affordable housing problem. So does New York. Housing, the average home price in Oakland, California is $750,000. Come on. Because people are buying houses and selling it for profit. Everybody does not earn enough to pay mortgage for $750,000, let alone $500,000. Come on. Affordable housing, California. So forcibly evicting people, it made national headlines. And so they negotiated a deal with the owner of the property, Wedgwood Inc., who owns 160 homes in that area. Imagine that. 
right and so they are selling it to, to, to a land trust and the land trust will now make it more accessible for others that sounds like a good thing to me we have a similar thing here in, in Detroit called the Detroit Land Bank but it was it's filled with corruption the houses are advertised but if you go to the auction you can never buy a house I have I know people who have tried to buy a house through it and it doesn't work it's 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 all it's 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 corrupt as corrupt as can be they might have it advertised for five hundred dollars just for the land but then by the time you go to the auction the, the price goes up to sixty seventy a hundred thousand dollars right corruption corruption and wicked public policy and redlining that have caused people to be homeless come on now right I know I don't know I, I think you all want me to talk about sex or talk about relationships and stuff like that that's not gonna fly we have real issues here with people being forcibly evicted out of places where they have nowhere else to go they would be homeless in California the housing situation is so bad that people maintain a gym membership just so they can have access to showers they park in parking lots and pay security guards to watch over them so they don't get raped at night and get robbed at night while they sleep can you believe that in California in the United States and we dare to talk about other countries that have problems with housing when we ourselves have created by policy not because it had to happen because there are plenty of houses that are vacant in a couple of days we're gonna do a story on vacant skyscrapers in New York yet there are 150,000 people every day seeking shelter in New York homeless people but skyscrapers in New York are vacant do you see what that is hungry money hungry rapacious capitalism that has hurt people I'm a capitalist I believe in free enterprise but it's becoming so that it's not free enterprise anymore it's becoming so that it's more about money so we're gonna talk about that but today I want to talk about what so it's trending on Twitter I, I, don't, I don't know if it's trending but they had a press conference it popped up on my timeline maybe it was from yesterday so I might be a day late but I retweeted it on my timeline so you can follow the story and see what is being achieved in Oakland California on behalf of these mothers who are left homeless with their children I know not suspect I know that this is a national problem because having done and reviewed all the studies done on homelessness in the United States I know recognize that it's a national problem right and whilst it seems to afflict communities of color more I have also observed that working-class Americans are also caught up in this vortex right so today on our show we're gonna talk about college educated white Americans who are what we call political hobbyists meaning they view politics as a hobby and we're gonna talk about it and I'd love some feedback if you can if you can just you know say something to me or tweet something to me so that because I want to know what you think about it and this is something that has been impacting American politics especially in the last 40 years and the impact it cannot be overlooked because these are folks who drive political opinion it's their opinion that politicians follow especially in today's day and time of social media when people can tweet or say whatever they want there are politicians uh, politicians have data analysts and so on and, and social media uh, p experts who are part of their campaign and their job is to troll social media in order to see what people are thinking and whom they're going to listen to are college educated white Americans that's the only opinion the politicians listen to when politicians talk about the middle class they're referring to white college educated Americans they're not talking to the upper class they're not talking to the working class they're not talking to the black upper class they're not talking to the black working class they are not talking to the Hispanic working class nor the Hispanic upper middle class they're also not talking to the Muslim community they're not talking to upper middle class Muslims nor working class Muslims they're not talking politicians do not address the concerns of people of color or communities of color politicians when they're talking about the issues notice what their hotbed issues are Medicare 
right? What you do with your IRA, taxes, who do those impact the most? College educated America, white Americans. That's who they listen to. And there is a reason for that. I must admit that white college educated Americans do talk a lot. They view politics as a hobby. They will sit down and watch the national news channels more than they watch the local news channels. I must admit, I'm probably a little guilty there. So let me put that disclaimer in, right? So they watch the national news channels more than they watch the local news channels. And then they, they talk with their friends and co-workers and their social clubs. If they go to the, 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 the country club, or if they go to play uh, whatever country clubs or social clubs that they're a part of, they discuss politics. Well, now that they have social media, they take to Facebook and Twitter and they talk about politics and their impact on politics is they follow public policy. Now, most of these college educated Americans are blue. They're blue in the sense that their money is blue. They have money. They're, they're, they're affluent, right? Their affluence is undeniable, but they're mostly liberal and they're mostly Democrat. Do you see what I'm saying? And they impact policy. Now, here's how their impact on policy is felt, on public policy. They tend to look out for what matters to them. So mom and dad need Medicare. They pay attention to Medicare and they're approaching the age when they need Medicare. They're worried about how much taxes they're going to pay if they take their money out of the IRA. They're worried about how much taxes they're going to pay on income tax and if they'll get a tax refund and how much it will be as opposed to the real issues. Now, take for instance, somebody who is an immigrant and who is impacted directly by public policy. This is why you've noticed there's such an apathy at public policy as announced by the Trump administration because it didn't affect white Americans. If you notice that white Americans across the board, it didn't bother them, it wasn't their issue. All this immigration stuff is just talk, talk, talk and fluff, but it didn't affect them. So they didn't pay attention to it. The problem with white Americans, white college educated Americans, is what? They're, they have what is called comfort. So they've graduated college, they're working stable jobs, they're financially stable. Politics is more like we just talk about it because it satisfies some kind of need they might have. Whether that need is perhaps intellectual, pseudo intellectualism, I would call it, or whether that need is emotional. They want to feel like they're involved. They don't do the hard work, however. You will not find them volunteering and campaigning. You will not find them at a town hall asking tough questions of po political uh, uh, candidates. No, they don't have time for that. I've been into some of these forums and the people who are asking questions are usually the people whom the policy would directly impact. College educated white Americans are usually past them sitting at a Starbucks or they're working out while I'm worried about how this a community or my people or my community will be impacted by a policy. Do you understand what I'm saying? When the immigration debate was taking place, I felt that that impacted me and others like me. I was at the forefront. I was in the mix. I wanted to know how was this going to be translated. I went to the source. I said, what exactly do you mean? And how is this going to be impacted? Because this is this, that, that, that. But white college educated Americans were just sitting there like, oh, okay. Well, I don't think it makes us look good. I think it makes us look horrible, but it did not directly impact them. Public policy at its intersection does not impact them negatively. This is why they're viewed as political hobbies because for them, politics is more a hobby. It's an opportunity for them to sit back and engage and talk and perhaps feel some level of political involvement, but they're never going to get involved in the issues. It, it's much different than in the era of civil rights when white Americans helped to mobilize civil rights, black civil rights leaders. White Americans paid and contributed to, for the civil rights movement to be successful. You best believe they paid for bus visits. They paid for bus trips. They paid for hotels. They organized. 
some of them were lawyers they went down south and marched and told people what their rights were based on the state that they were in white americans did that where are those white americans today you know where they are sitting in the comforts of their living room contemplating their next vacation whilst at the same time logging into schwab.com and checking on their IRA and the status of how much what their investment portfolio looks like. In other words, what I'm saying is their culture of comfort has blinded them to the realities of what public policy and politics has done to people's lives. The same America that they claim to love, the same America that they claim they will defend forever, the same America is crumbling and rotting while on their watch because all that they do is view politics. A writer described it as, a, for a political hobbyist, politics is like people who watch Sports Center and think they know enough about football and they're literally dictating to the coach and the football players and, and the quarterbacks how to play the game and they're not in the game. It's kind of like what we used to call Monday morning quarterbacking. Now they're looking at the mess that they have created with their apathy by sitting back and allowing politicians to think that the only America that ever existed was the one in which they lived. And now we have a society where everything, our entire infrastructure is crumbling. I read a report yesterday, I think it was on the BBC, I was startled. They were referencing how Britain, in pursuit of its Brexit or its exit from the European Union, what kind of political and social model as a country should they embody to the rest of the world? And a suggestion was made that they should try Canada's model. You know, Canada doesn't get involved in anything, just kind of quiet, maintains a balance in how it deals with America and Britain and everybody else. Just kind of like, yeah, I'm here, but you know, I don't really get involved in anything. That's a Canadian. They're like, yeah, we keep our economy. We're good. We're okay. You know, hey, that's Canada. So they were suggesting that that's the, the model Britain should carry. In that same commentary, they said this about the American system, that the American poli political system, not only is it a mess, but it is subject to insurgency because it's not working. Why? Because the time has come when the intersection of public policy over the last 40 years has so directly negatively impacted people's lives that finally it's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. That's what we're all seeing. Where were college educated white Americans when these policies were being enacted? You know what you were doing? Being aloof and being elitist. You were smothering and laughing behind people's faces that it's because you're black that this happens. It's because you're a colored. It's because you're a Hispanic. It's because you're a Indian. It's because you're a Mexican. It's because you're a everything else. And oh, it doesn't affect me. Oh, I'm sorry, I gotta go to bed. Let me go drink my wine and sip my wine. Oh, and I'll just get in my Tesla and drive tomorrow. That's what you were doing while the country you claim to love is, has, is crumbling. Forget about our physical infrastructure. Our societal infrastructure is gone. We're imploding from within. We went to the polls in 2016. We claimed we elected a guy. We knew exactly what that guy was going to be like. He, he, he didn't hide it. One thing you'll see about Trump, he's not a hypocrite. He's straightforward and blunt. We may not like it, but he did say what he want, what he was going to do. What did college educated white Americans do? Trump was elected by college educated white, 58% of college educated white women elected Donald Trump. You all knew what he was going to do. He said he was going to do it. He didn't lie. Did he? He didn't lie. Was he a hypocrite? Nope. He said what he was going to do before he won and 58% of college educated white women went and voted for Donald Trump. When he got elected, he did exactly what he said he was going to do. Then all of a sudden, oh my God, oh my God, what a horror. We look terrible to the rest of the world. Oh my God, the world thinks we're a horrible group of people. You knew what the man said he was going to do. That's because you're a political hobbyist. 
you don't get involved at the macro level. You don't go get involved and organize and stand out there and interpret the policy. No. You just look at it and you looked at Donald Trump and you said, well, he's a great white hope. He's going to restore America to be white again because you associate power with being white. Barack Obama was president of these United States. We didn't lose world power. We didn't lose face in the eyes of the world. He maintained our power. He increased it. He garnered respect. He kept wars from happening. He made a deal with our sworn enemy, Iran. I said, all right, the money we're going to give you is the money that was held up for years because of economic sanctions. Then we elected a guy who changed all of that because he just sat back and said, I don't like how that guy did it. And he changed it. And now you're all sitting back saying, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. No, it's your fault. And this is exactly what this is about. White, college educated white Americans who view politics as a hobby have destroyed the country, the very country that you claim to love. If you don't believe me, take up your American passport as a white American and go overseas right now. Go anywhere in the world, just take off, take a trip, go to France, go to places in Africa, go down to South America, go to other parts of the world right now as a white American with your American passport and see how the world perceives us. If you don't want to do that, pick up the BBC. Have you ever heard of the Voice of America? The Voice of America is 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 our uh, propaganda uh, station that we broadcast to the rest of the world. The Voice of America makes us sound good because one thing with our military, they love their country. They love us. They're like, you all are idiots, you can act all you want, but as for me, I'm gonna defend. So when I go back home, I have somewhere to go to. The military loves their country. So they do everything they can to defend homeland at all times. But what do college educated white Americans? They sit back, they looked at Michelle Obama walking up the steps of Air Force One and hated that a black woman who is a descendant of slave whom their ancestors used to enslave they hated that and made that emotional decision made a political decision based on emotion based on just politics as a hobby that crippled the country for the next we're going to feel the effects for the next 20 years that's the danger right they looked at barack obama and they're like no way can a negro be powerful and run this country. After all, this is a country for us. I'm American. And being American is what? And they got holy and sanctified. And 58% of college educated white women who heard Donald Trump on the campaign trail disintegrate and demolish and say exactly what he was going to do, they went and voted for him. And now all of a sudden, they're all over Twitter. Oh my God, I can't believe. He said he was going to do it, lady and gentlemen. He did it. These are the people who gather on their porches. And, uh, well, we got to do something. So they get together and they donate to a campaign. Yes, they do. They'll give a $5 here and there. But they will never do the actual work because public policy does not impact them. My daughter went to law school. There's a girl who is a white girl. Who is whom they went two two people went to law school different circumstances <clears throat> the opportunities for her were laid before she even graduated it didn't matter that she didn't have her parents weren't wealthy no she was white that gave her the access it was interesting for me to just look at it and study the model and she feels some sort of remorse that my daughter is not uh achieving as much as she's yeah she feels a little bad you can tell but how far does that go that feeling go nowhere because at the end of the day she's going to do what make sure that those opportunities continue to exist for her and people like her that's what political hobbyism does it's all about college educated white americans to show you the disconnect college educated white americans 
have completely forgotten that there are white people who live in rural America. Otherwise, they would be concerned about broadband reaching rural America. College-educated white Americans have forgotten about their ancestors who still live in, 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 in Coal Town, Virginia. Coal Town, West Virginia. The, the mountains of the Appalachians. They've forgotten about the Appalachian Trails. They've forgotten about rural Kentucky. Right? Call it white college-educated American. College-educated white Americans. They've forgotten about their distant cousins who still eat roadkill and still live in a trailer park somewhere. Because again, public policy does not impact them. So for them, politics is a hobby. White college-educated Americans have forgotten that they're descendants of farmers. So they elected a man who didn't see the ramifications or didn't think it through the ramifications of inter creating a trade war with China that directly impacted farmers and have robbed farmers of their livelihood who have been farmers for generations. Because, oh my God, all they were thinking about is that. And at the end of the day, when the day is over and the rest of us have to deal with the consequences of their public policy, right? At the end of the day, you know what they do? They go and work out. They still can pay their mortgage. They still have affordable rates on their credit cards, their mortgages, and their car payments. They can still send their kids to college. They'll just take out some more loans. For God's sake, that's what everyone does. They still live on credit. And they forget the reality that they have caused. Call white college educated Americans live in a culture of comfort. No one forgot shit. Like, what are you saying? You forgot about the successful black people? You're just a blind, ignorant person. That's how you feel. This is how I feel. So, thank you for your comments. Right? So, what the danger, the danger of this is what I have found is that when this was first brought to my attention, what I found was that the apathy that I observed, I said, well, I find the same apathy with upper middle class black folks. College educated black Americans also feel that they're not impacted by public policy. Redlining, right? And, and, po and policies that are aimed at robbing people who are marginal or working class Americans, I found that that's the same way they feel. College educated black Americans also don't get up and go organize because it does not impact them. At the end of the day, we have a culture of comfort. Don't you see where I'm going? Don't you see what this is all about? The culture of comfort is ruining us. We are forgetting that the reason our democracy was great is because we advanced and we organized and we petitioned that's what made us great. The day we sit back and allow politicians to impose upon us their viewpoints is the day our society began crumbling. It's the same thing with college-educated black Americans. It's the same thing with college-educated Latinos. They want to say, it's not me. That doesn't affect me. I don't have anybody like that. It's not me. It's the same thing. And I used to think that, I used to think that, you know, Maybe, uh, you know, it's not my story, it's not my issue, until it intersects with you. And I suspect that what we're seeing right now played out with the impeachment trial in the Senate, what we're seeing is, is an intersection. And you're seeing exactly how it is being played out by the people who are interested and have vested interests right there. I tell you one thing, though, you know how you can change it if you don't like it. 2020 is here. You may not like it because it boils your blood up because you're looking at it emotionally. I can't afford to get emotional. I can't even afford to become so passionate that I don't see the facts. But these are the facts. You don't like it? Tough. It is what it is. The statistics and the data don't lie. Because the statistics prove what I am saying and I'll post the link to the story. And this is not even in defending my viewpoint. This is what it is. We have a culture of comfort. You know what our culture of comfort dictates? Our culture of comfort 
We used to say that by the grace of God go I. Now we don't even say that. We drive past homeless people who live in homeless colonies. I challenge you, go down the street, go down to the city and see where homeless people live. You might work in a community and then you drive home so you never see the homeless. One of the wealthiest uh, communities here in Southeast Michigan is Brighton, right? A few months ago, I had the distinct honor of being a keynote speaker at an event there. And one of the things I learned was that there was a homeless community in Brighton. I said, no way. I said, that cannot be. You're all medium to, to upper middle class. What, 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 what happened? There are homeless communities everywhere. They just do a real good job of hiding it. And the people who are homeless there used to perhaps live in an apartment or a townhouse or something like that and are newly homeless so they don't want anyone to know. So they hang out in certain spaces. There are homeless people everywhere because public policy is such now. Housing values are out of whack. <laughs> if you, you don't have to. Can I just ask you a favor? If you're going to be make a comment, if you are not going to be respectful, please leave my space. I will not tolerate disrespect. I will even ask Twitter and Periscope to block you. You do not need to come in my space and be disrespectful because I don't go in your space and disrespect you. I am free and I have my opinion. If you don't like it, go find somewhere else to be, but don't come on my space and try to tell me anything else that's not complimentary. Don't try it with me. I'm not the one. I will complain to Twitter and have them block you forever. So don't come here with your racist BS and your racist troll. Don't try it with me. I'm not the one. Am I clear? I'm pretty sure you got that very clear. Don't do that here. So if you don't like this discourse, go somewhere else. But don't pu don't push me. I will do it. So the commentary has to be well, what are we going to do? Because it's very clear we have a problem. How do we get these couch? It, it, it's kind of like Monday morning quarterbacking. After the game, Sunday, everybody has an opinion on what the quarterback should have done. So you're now going to tell the coach and the team and how to play. It's the same thing. What do you do with these couch folks who are so, who are looking, every decision they make comes from their center of comfort. It doesn't really affect them. It, I saw the same thing in 2016. Upper middle class Americans were apathetic. They heard what Trump said he was going to do, but to them, it didn't impact them because they have certain levels between them and public policy. They, had, they could afford to send their kids to college. They can afford their mortgage. Some of them had second homes, right? They had their businesses. They were comfortable. So the public policy, it didn't really affect them. In fact, they were looking at the tax break like, I probably am going to make some more money and I can afford to do more things. So they became comfortable. Trump is a master at that. He's a mastermind. He figured that out. He said, if I do this to this group and this group, they will be apathetic and they won't get involved in the process. Because the real process, how you make the real changes at the grassroots level. When I looked at both political parties. I'll tell you one thing, the Democrats organize from the grassroots level. The Republicans organize from the top down. The Democrats, they organize at the grassroots level. That's how come they bring out their rallies are so large. The Republicans have not seen large rallies until Trump riled everybody up. He knew exactly what to say. He knew what the pressing points were. He knows people. People are his business. So he knew what to say to get the couch potatoes involved and he did it successfully. And those same people who for them politics is just a hobby because at the end of the day, does public policy impact college educated Americans? No, they still can buy a house. Now a college educated black American, he might pay more for his house, but guess what? He still can afford it. There's a difference. He can still afford it. He's still going to pay it because it means to him that he's placed based on his perception of who he is. He's still going to pay the price to become that. We have a problem. 
And in the meantime, we're still looking at our crumbling infrastructure. We're looking at our social system where it has tipped in the other direction. There are gaps being created right now between the rich and the poor. The gap, it used to be, okay, there was a solid middle class and then it started disintegrating. And now the middle class is gone. And you're either rich or poor. And some of you are like, well, I'm not struggling. Really? Show me your bank balance. Show me your debt to income ratio. Show me how much you owe as opposed to how much you own. Because many of us are living in, in mini mansions that cost us more than it's worth. You are paying $750,000 for a house valued at $400,000. Look at how much you're paying in mortgage. How much do you owe? You paid $5,000 to get into that house. It's going to take you a lifetime to pay it off. How much do you owe compared to how much you own? How much money do you have in the bank? Your house is worth $450,000, but you're not good for a hundred grand. Your 401k, you borrow a little bit out of it to keep the mortgage level and keep the credit cards. You get a tax return this year that keeps you good for at least three, four months. And then the rest of the year, it's, it's credit all the way. Think about that. But again, you are lulled into comfort. You're going to buy groceries, you head down to the big box. The big blue box. Well, in Costco's case, it's the big red box. I love Costco. <laughs> I love Sam's Club too, but I love Costco more. Right? <laughs> I love me some Costco. I just like walking through it all. <laughs> right? When I get a chance to, which is not very often these days. Right? But you have a card. So you go down to the store and you put your plastic down. You, if you don't believe me, drive into any middle class community on a Saturday. The big box stores are full. The do-it-yourself stores are just as full. You know what that is? Credit. They're not using cash. That's credit. Go and ask people how much you owe as opposed to how much you own. It's You do it yourself on yourself. You're going to be shocked. I've been, I, t I tell you a personal story. Years ago, I think it was about 11 years ago now, when the housing crisis crashed, my mother, who lived in Detroit, told me to go and buy a house in Detroit. I said, nah, the school district sucks. The crime sucks. She said, you'll never get another opportunity to buy a house for the prices that they are. It's going to turn around eventually. Did not believe. I paid the price for that. I was still paying rent because I wanted to stay in a good school district. I was paying rent of $1,200 a month. Mom said, that's a waste of money. Don't do it. Take the money you get from the contract and go buy the house. I did not do it. You know, I paid the price for that. I didn't see what she was saying. She was saying, buy a house that you never own a mortgage on. When the property values increase, you will own all the equity in the house. I couldn't see that. Then at the same time, Somebody else was whispering in my ear, go buy a car without a note. I'm like, how can you do that? Couldn't think of it. Somebody said, go to the auction, buy a car without a note. Don't pay a car note. I couldn't see it. Do you know who does that now? I own a house that I don't own a mortgage on. I own a car that I don't owe a note on. I own land that I don't owe Hello, somebody. So at the same time, I'm asking you, what do you owe versus what you own? I can show you what I own as opposed to what I do owe. Do you see where I'm coming from? So my culture of comfort is at a different place. However, I still remain active because to me, public policy is intersecting people's lives. And wherever that intersection occurs, people disparately are suffering. I see it every day. I'm driving down the street and there are more homeless people on the bridge over at 8 Mile and the Lodge. You ever notice that they rotate them out there? I drive down uh, Woodward and under the bridge at 8 Mile is a homeless colony. They have issues in Ferndale because the homeless walk up to the gas stations in Ferndale, which is between 8 and 9 Mile, right? And they use people's uh, businesses and use the restrooms in those facilities. 
And when you ask homeless people, why don't you go to a shelter? They say, well, I get robbed in the shelter, they get raped in the shelter, they get attacked in the shelter, and during the day, they don't have anywhere else to go. So right under 8 Mile and Woodward is a whole homeless colony. Like, there are people living there. You ever drive through there at night? Don't. One night during, I think it was near Christmas, I, I, I missed, I don't know how I ended up there. I was literally like, this was a few years ago, I couldn't believe my eyes. I had to go start asking questions. What happened? Oh my word, I missed a meeting yesterday. <laughs> I missed a homeless meeting yesterday. Do you see what I'm saying? We ha That's where public policy at its intersection of people's lives. The same is true for what is happening in Oakland with Moms for Housing. They're having issues. It's the same thing happening in communities across the country. We can no longer just sit back and say, well, it's not me, it doesn't affect me. It does. And that's where our, cult, our comfort has to go. We have to overlook our comfort. November is coming. It's not enough to just say, okay, I'm gonna donate to this campaign, I'm gonna donate. Go get organized. Listen to what the politicians are saying. Let them know that this does not matter. See, with the difference between college-educated white Americans, they don't really get involved in politics. This is the same is true for black, uh, black college-educated Americans as well. They don't really interact with the politicians. They kind of just sit on the periphery and observe. And then when they hear the things that happen, they say, wow, that is shocking. Wow, that's too horrible. That's bad. But to get organized, to agitate, to go organize and to go to other people and to say to politicians this shouldn't happen. Right? We got to do something. I've been in both I've listened to both sides. I've been in Republican settings, I've been in Democratic settings. Something has got to change. We have a society that is crumbling. We're not as great as we once were and we don't even realize it. We have lost our compass. We have lost where we are going. We used to be focused on the good of all. We lost that. Now it's the good of me. What is good for my bank account? What is good for my position? It's not for the good of all because we have forgotten that if it is good for all, it's going to be good for us. If the society works, it works. What, can I just ask you something? Let's just level the playing field right here. Let's just level it right here, right now. What do you think, quantifiably, what is the best outcome that you think is going to happen when homeless people get tired of living like that? What do you think is gonna happen? What right now they're contained because they don't wanna what? Go to jail, they don't wanna get in trouble. But what do you think is going to happen when more and more people become homeless? Do you realize property values are going up? Do you realize that rent is so astronomically high? Do you realize employers do what is now called at-will employment? Where they can fire you if they want to. They don't give you 40 hours a week in order for you to make enough to pay wages that you can live off. So I'm going to ask you the question one more time. What do you think is likely to happen when homeless people get tired of living on the street? What do you think is going to happen? What do you think is, that's where our society is crumbling? You know how we used to prevent that? By being, having a moral compass, by being empathetic, and by being compassionate. We made sure there were public policies in place for those who were not as wealthy as ourselves. So you didn't go to college, so you have to work there. Okay, so there are policies, there are projects for you to do. There are places for you to go. You know what we sat back and said? Oh, they shouldn't do that. The poor will be with us always. Keeping the poor and pro making sure there are provisions under social services is keeping the society intact. Taking away programs for the poor is creating anarchy. That's what I mean by the society, the infrastructure is crumbling. It's not just the bridges that are broken. It's not just the roads that are horrible. Here in Michigan, we have the worst roads this side of heaven. The roads are bad. Every time I'm tired of driving on bad roads and repairing my darn car. 
We have a governor who was elected. The first thing she did, one of the first things she did, she claims she's a Democrat. College educated white women. You know what she did? The first thing she did? She wanted to put a gas tax hike of 45 cents. People had to say, wait, she lost her mind. Maybe she something. She drank too much wine last night. That's not it. No. She went and took money out of charter schools. Do you know it was the Republican legislators who had to say, girl, stop. No. You can't do that. No, we're not going to sign off on that. Believe it or not. The same people who elected her, she stomped right all over them. Took the money out of charter schools. People communities that were already marginalized. The Republicans even had to stop her. I said, girl, no, stop. Girl, no, we're not going to do that. You can't do that to the people. These are the people who elected you. It's like committing political suicide. That's what I'm talking about because she was looking at it from what? Her comfort level. It doesn't impact me. It doesn't impact anyone I know. So this policy can go through the door. The Republicans had a proposal for people on Medicaid to go work 20 hours a week to qualify for Medicaid. People complained to her and said I, they can't work, they have issues, they have you know, uh, sick relatives at home, blah, 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 sick children. What do you think girlfriend did as soon as she got elected? That's one of the, she was going to continue with what the Republicans started. Even they had to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait just a minute. Wait, 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 wait. We we we, we kind of had to take a second look at that. It really isn't good. Do you see college educated white Americans who think that they have it so good, they live in a bubble. And the bubble they live in, the America they live in disappeared and they still don't see it. There is a sheen of a veneer, I should call it, of prosperity that really is promoted by what? Credit and access to credit. You realize we have better credit scores today? That means they're throwing money at you. You, you, you can get better credit cards, higher limit credit cards, blah, blah, blah. It creates a veneer of prosperity that is not real because when it crumbles, it crumbles. <laughs> right? They look at public policy as a hobby. Well, I can talk about that because I have the privilege to talk about it. They might not use the words privilege, but that's what their positioning says. This doesn't, I don't have to get involved. This is not something that I view. I would rather go do my yoga and go meet the girls at the club for a drink. Then we can probably talk about it. I find that black, upper middle class, college educated Americans simulate the same viewpoints and the same behaviors as white college educated Americans. I don't know if it's in an effort to fit in or it's, you know, it's Stockholm syndrome or what, but it's a sociological perspective, indeed. Indeed. Let me see if that guy is still on my timeline. I did warn him and I'm gonna report him to Twitter. Uh, what's his name? I'm going to report him to Twitter, right? This is an open forum. And whilst I welcome your discourse, I also ask you to be mindful that there are others on here and that you are respectful to me and you're respectful about yourself and you're respectful to others, right? It's not just me. We got to It's a community. We're all in the same boat. We're trying to find solutions. So please be respectful, right? We don't have to agree. In fact, I like that. But that's why we're a democracy. We disagree, but we're not cursing one another or calling each other names, right? This is some serious food for thought. I'm gonna publish the link on the article. I do want you to read it. When you read it, you, you might see from a different perspective because maybe me seeing it, you don't see it. But when you read it, it's going to help you identify. And you're going to say, you know something? So I'm going to post it on all my social media platforms. So Facebook and Twitter, most of us are on Facebook and Twitter. So you will see the link so you can see it. it it's mind blowing. We, we got to do better. 
we have a society that's crumbling. You know, we don't help anybody. You know the worst, you know the group that we, it is evident the most that we really aren't helping are vets. People who have fought in wars and who have given their lives in service to their country and they come back and we've public policy and politicians have taken monies out of programs that helps veterans. My God in heaven, are you serious? They're homeless veterans, veterans who have PTSD, veterans who have uh, mental health issues. War is not a good place and it's not a nice thing. They come back with issues and the, the, the programs that support them, we took the money out of it. And we are sitting from the comfort of our porches with our long stem sh uh, champagne glasses saying, that's not my issue. It doesn't impact me. Poor things. That is so horrible. We got to do better. America, where did we go? You want to make America great again? Get involved. That's what made America great in the first place. During World War II, women and men lined up. Women dressed as men to go fight wars. Women cooked, they, cleaned, they, they ran industries until the men returned. You want to make America great again? Go get involved. That's what makes America great. This is Harriet Kamek with Down to Earth. Thank you for your participation. I enjoyed my time with you. Go to my website, HarrietKamek.com. Continue to listen to our podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Podcast Addict, Apple, Google, Spotify, Spreaker, <laughs> right? Breaker. Overcast, anywhere there's a podcast platform, we're there. Right? Thank you so much. I appreciate your time and your energy. And I appreciate you taking being a part of my experience this morning. We talk about the issues that matter. This is down to earth. It's just a down to earth conversation, y'all. That's all. Say it. It's down to earth, right? Thanks so much, everybody. Be blessed.